Good morning and welcome to Trinity United Methodist Church. My name is Rob Elmy and I'm the pastor here at Trinity. We are delighted that you are here to worship with us on this Valentine's Day. A very special uh, happy Valentine's Day to all that are worshiping with us this morning as we come to celebrate the greatest love of all, God's love for us. If you're a guest with us this morning, we especially want to welcome you. We are delighted that uh, you are here to worship with us this morning. And whether you're a guest with us this morning or you regularly worship with us here at Trinity United Methodist Church, I want to call your attention to the description of the video. There in the description of the video, you'll see a link uh, to register your attendance with us. It would be a blessing to us to know that you have been worshiping with us. And so if you want to take a moment to go ahead and click on that link. I also find a couple other things in the description of that video. First, you will uh, find the worship order. That is uh, what we'll be following as we go through our service this morning. If you want to follow along, it contains uh, the words to the hymns that we're going to sing and some of the other parts of our service. If you wanted to uh, print that out, we encourage you to go ahead and do so. You'll also find a link to what's called our weekly trumpet. This is a, a paper that tells about what's happening in the life of our church in terms of uh, events and those types of things. And again, we invite you to take a, a look at that. There are a couple of announcements I do want to call to your attention. First, this coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. It marks the very beginning of the season of preparation called Lent. It is uh, a time where uh, we examine ourselves and we have an appreciation of uh, who we are and whose we are. And part of that is um, marking uh, the sign of the cross and ashes on our forehead. We are going to be having an in-person uh, Ash Wednesday service. So that's going to be Wednesday at 7 o'clock. For the imposition of the ashes, persons will be putting uh, ashes on their own forehead so that we can maintain the safeguards. We will be operating under the safeguards that we usually operate under on Sunday mornings. And so at 7 o'clock, Wednesday uh, here at the church. We will also be streaming that uh, online on our Facebook page. And so if you'd like to uh, tune in uh, via the live stream, you can do that 7 o'clock Wednesday on Facebook. I also want to let you know that earlier in the day on that Wednesday is also a Love Wednesday. Love Wednesday is where we collect uh, goodies, both store-bought and homemade. We take them to folks that are working in our community. Uh, this particular Wednesday, we are going to be uh, blessing the teachers and staff at King George Middle School. And so uh, if you wanted to bring something in, we uh, would love for you to do that. What we really need help with is some folks to uh, help assemble and to deliver. And so uh, we meet at 10 o'clock to uh, go out and to deliver those. Again, it's just right down the road at, at the middle school. If you were so inclined to help in that way, we would uh, invite you to do so. Well, having uh, made those announcements and given that welcome, I'm going to invite you to uh, join with me in the call to worship. You can find that printed in that order of worship I told you about a moment ago. And I invite you to respond to the parts that are in bold. And for the sake of the continuity of our worship, I'm going to read um, both the parts for the minister as well as the parts for the people. We are branches rooted in the vine of Christ. We come because we seek to abide in Christ. The branches that remain in the vine bear much fruit. We come because we long to be spiritually vibrant, alive, productive. If we abide in Christ, then Christ's words will abide in us. We come because we strive to be faithful disciples. We gather for worship now to the glory of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May we grow in our faith and love of Jesus. Will you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity and the privilege and the freedom to come and to worship you. We pray, O oh God, that as we come and worship you this morning, that your name would be lifted up and glorified. We pray, O oh God, that as we worship you and we turn our hearts and minds to you, that your Holy Spirit would manifest his presence in our midst, wherever we find ourselves, that your spirit would witness to our spirit that we are indeed your children, that we are loved with an everlasting love. 
And so, Lord, we offer ourselves, we offer our praise and our thanksgiving, we offer our songs, we offer our hearts to you in worship this morning. May it truly bring honor and glory to your name. May you bless this time that we share together as we bless you. In Jesus' sweet and precious name we pray. Amen. I invite you to join with me in our first hymn this morning. It's number 57 in the hymnal. It's called, All Four Thousand Tongues to Sing. You'll find the word printed in the order of worship or there up on the screen. Oh, four thousand tongues to sing. this picture of a tree because this tree represents really well kind of our relationship to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. One thing to notice about the tree is that the tree has uh, some branches and some leaves that come out from the tree trunk which of course um, also the, the tree has some tree roots and the tree roots that go into the ground that the tree gets its nutrients nutrients from the soil as well as water that goes into the soil and it comes up um, into the tree and of course allows for the branches to grow for the trees to grow for the tree to get leaves and to um, flourish and so if you think about it if for some reason those nutrients and that water stop flowing from the roots of that tree up to the branches into the leaves what would happen to the leaves is that they would die and, and fall off the tree and that even the branches uh, might die and fall off the tree well boys and girls that's kind of how it is with us and jesus if you kind of think about uh, jesus as um, our tree roots and it is through him that we get the life-giving nutrients of his love and his strength and his power that help us to flourish we're kind of like the leaves and the branches but if we don't stay connected to the roots then we can't flourish we can't be all that jesus calls us to be in a moment i'm going to read the scripture for us and jesus uses the the words that i am the vine but he could have said I am the roots and he goes on to say and you are the branches and apart from me you can do nothing 
And so I hope every time you might see a tree, it might be a reminder to you to stay connected to Jesus. Because when we stay connected to Jesus, that we receive his life-giving love and strength and power. And that can make all the difference. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are the source of all life-giving love, all power, and all strength. And we thank you, Jesus, that you give all of that to us so willingly. Help us, Jesus, to stay connected to you, to stay connected to you just as a tree is connected to its roots so that we can flourish, so that we can be all that you would have us to be, so that we can love as you have loved us. All these things we pray in your powerful name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the 15th chapter of John. It's verses 1 uh, through 12. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you happen to be just joining us this morning, I want to welcome you. My name is Rob Elman. I'm the pastor here at Trinity. And if you are just joining us, I want to encourage you to go ahead and to click on the link in the video description to register your attendance with us. It would be a blessing to know that you are here to worship with us this morning. You'll also find in that video description a link to the message download. That is the outline of my message for this morning, which we're about to get into in just a moment. So if you want to pause the video and click on that link and go ahead and bring that up and even print it out, you can go ahead and fill in the blanks as we go and use that to maybe take some notes and revisit later on. But if you would join your heart with mine, and let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get into our message for this morning. Let's pray. God, I pray that you protect me from me, that you hide me behind the cross of Jesus, that after all has been said and done, that he would be lifted up, that he would be worshipped and, and glorified. I pray, O oh God, that your spirit would be over us this morning as your word is proclaimed. I thank you, Lord, that your word says that when your word is proclaimed, it shall not return to you void. But pour out your Holy Spirit on us this morning to open our ears and our minds and our hearts, that we might just receive what you'd have us to receive, that it would dwell in us richly, that it would change us, that it would bring us comfort and peace, Lord, that it would um, disturb us and inspire us. Lord, that it would just do what you have designed it to do. Pray, O oh God, that glory and honor might be brought to your name by the words that are spoken and the meditations of our hearts, minds, and spirits. We pray all these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. 
This Sunday, we're uh, finishing up a, a series of messages we've been doing here at Trinity United Methodist Church called I Am Jesus. In previous messages, I've explained to you how we have been looking at those sayings of Jesus as we find them in John's Gospel. We call them the I Am sayings. We're seven times in John's Gospel. Jesus makes a pronouncement about himself, and he starts each pronouncement by saying, I am, and then he finishes it. And in so doing, he tells us about some characteristic of himself. And so we've been spending some time looking at those characteristics that Jesus has said about himself, and not just looking at what they mean, but then asking the question, well, how does that apply to us? What meaning does that have for us in, in our lives? And so we start off the, the first week talking about Jesus as the good shepherd. When Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, then last week we spent some time looking at what it means when Jesus says, I am the light of the world and what that meant for our lives. And so today we are finishing up this series of, of messages and we are looking at the I am statement when Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, and apart from me, you can do nothing. Now you have heard me say as we have looked at each of, of these passages, and you have heard me say in previous messages, even before that, that when we look at different passages in the Bible, it's always important to understand the context of that passage. And what I mean by the context is when it occurs in the Bible. It's kind of like what is happening during the time that we are talking about in the particular Bible passage that we are looking at. And what happened before that passage? And what happens after that passage. Well, when we look, church, at John chapter 15, what we will see is that just a couple of chapters before, in John chapter 13, if we were to look closely there, we would see that Jesus was sharing a last meal with his disciples. We call it the Last Supper. That at that last meal in John's gospel, Jesus had even taken off the towel around his waist, and he used it to wash the feet of his disciples. Yes, the master washed the feet of the disciples. So that's a little bit about what's going on before our passage today in John chapter 15. Fast forward a little bit to John chapter 18, and what we find is that Jesus is being arrested. He is on his way to the cross. And so sandwiched in between this time when Jesus shares this last meal with his disciples, the Last Supper, to when he is arrested and on his way to the cross, we receive this kind of body of teaching that Jesus gives to his disciples. And in the midst of that, where he says, I am the vine and you are the branches, apart from me you can do nothing. Now I want to ask you a question. If you knew that you were going to die soon, and you only had a limited amount of time with your loved ones, with your children or your grandchildren, whoever it is that is closest to you. And you only had a certain amount of time to convey to them truths and your heart and all of those things. Don't you think that you would convey to them the important things, how much you love them? That you would convey to them some important teachings that you might want to pass on? Well, I think that's what Jesus is doing here in between these things. He knows that he has limited time left with his disciples. And so he wants to teach them these important things. And among these important things that he wants to teach them is this passage that we get from John chapter 15 where he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The teaching Jesus gives his disciples in John 15 is vitally important because of where it is located, in other words, because of its context. So Jesus says in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is, is kind of using a, you know, an agricultural image here to describe our need to remain connected to him so that we can bear fruit for him. 
You know, in the uh, backyard of uh, one of the houses my family and I used to live in, we had one of those wisteria vines. Now, I don't know if you've ever grown wisteria, but they, they grow up pretty fast, and they, they tend to grow up, um, at least at our house, that we had this trellis-like thing where they would grow up on it, and they would grow in uh, these vines, and they have branches that would go all over the place. And it was necessary for me to get up on a ladder from time to time and to cut back those wisteria vines and branches because they would end up getting into the other trees that were around that trellis and they would end up choking out those trees. And so the thing about these wisteria vines and branches is at the very bottom where the wisteria vine would come out of the ground, it was pretty thick. I mean, it was like two or three inches around it. It, at least, and of course, as it got higher and higher, as, as the vine kind of stretched out into some branches, it got thinner and thinner, and that's what I had to cut. But if I had a cut that thick vine at the very bottom, coming out of the ground, not only would my wife have probably, you know, drawn up divorce papers, or at the very least, given me a whole bunch of grief for cutting down the beautiful wisteria. I didn't think it was too beautiful myself, but we're still working on that in our marriage. But all the branches at the top of that wisteria vine would die because they were cut off from the source of the nutrients, from the water of that thick vine at the bottom that allowed them to spread out, that allowed them to bear their fruit, which of course was, I'll, I'll kind of admit it, it does put off a pretty flower, but you know, at the end, I don't think it's worth worth all the work. But anyways, so this is the picture that Jesus is giving us here. I believe he's saying that Jesus, I am the big thick vine coming out of the ground, and that you and I, as his followers, are the branches, and it's essential that we remain in Him. I want us to notice a few other things the scripture says this morning. Jesus promises that if we remain in him, if we remain connected to him, that we will bear much fruit. Interesting, isn't it, that we do not bear fruit on our own? That we don't bear fruit in our own strength, but only when we are connected to the source of our love and power and wisdom and strength, Jesus Christ. Another thing in this passage is to recognize not only the positive of remaining in him and therefore bearing much fruit, but also what happens if we don't remain in him. Just like if I cut off the bottom of the wisteria root and the branches die, so too if we cut ourselves off from the vine, Jesus Christ, we become powerless. We shrivel up. We die spiritually. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. We think we can do it ourselves sometimes in our own strength. But what we'll one day find is that even though we might have a little bit of success bearing some fruit, we will one day run out of energy. We will one day run out of strength. We will one day run out of our own wisdom. The purpose of remaining in him to bear fruit has everything to do, church, with bringing God glory. In verse 8 of this chapter, Jesus says this, This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Interesting too, isn't it? That we're to remain connected to the vine, that we are to remain connected to Jesus, not just so we can have some religious experience, not just so that we can feel good about ourselves, but that we remain connected to the vine so that we can bear fruit for him. Now, as a byproduct of that, we will feel good. We'll have religious experiences. But the primary purpose of staying connected to the vine is to bear much fruit. Now, I don't know about you, friend, but I dream a church, right, that would be full of people that are connected to the vine bearing much fruit. I dream a church connected and so connected to the vine Jesus Christ 
then we will literally transform our community by bearing fruit. I dream a church that's so connected to the vine that people's lives and eternities are changed because they're a part of that church. I dream a church where whole families are changed because people discover Jesus, where we baptize just as many adults as we do cute little babies. I dream a church that is so connected to the vine that we're on fire for Jesus so much and we're bearing so much fruit because we're connected to that vine and he's empowering us that we impact our community so that no child goes to bed hungry, so that no child has to live in a hotel, where we reduce teen pregnancies, where because of our witness and because of people coming to Christ, our ministry touches people so that they change their lives and our community is changed. There's less crime, there's less violence. I dream a church where we hold up the name of Jesus Christ. So much so that an addict can hear of healing that can only come from Jesus. I dream a place in the church where marriages are safe. I dream a place that's so connected to the vine that people improve their financial lot by following God's prescription for handling money and possessions. Because after all, the Bible has a lot to say about handling money and possessions. And we live in a community where people are struggling with their money and their possessions and their finances. For too long, I'm afraid, we in the church, and I'm talking about the church universal, that we've not been connected to the vine because we have not been connected to the vine, we have settled for mediocre. Because we have not been connected to the vine, we have settled for being impotent. Because we have not been connected to the vine, we have settled in being just another organization, just another club. But you know what? That's not how God intends it. Because the church is his plan A. We are his body, his hands, and his feet to a lost and hungry world. You know, friends, some historians have suggested that way back in the 1700s, long time ago, right? When other countries like France were undergoing bloody revolutions in Europe, that it was a people called Methodists that had a passion for reaching people, particularly poor people, people the church of their day had neglected. They had such a passion for personal holiness that it was this passion to see people come to Jesus. And not just see them come to Jesus, but then to see and help them transform their lives, to see them grow in grace. That it was that movement that saved England from a bloody revolution like that which France underwent. That's what some historians say. That's a pretty high praise. Or I think of a man you know, who once it said returned to a place in that same country where he was raised. He remembered his hometown as a, as a place of ill repute, filled with wretched and vile people who were engaged in all kinds of mischief, all kinds of revelry, all kinds of cheating, all kinds of bad things. And when he came home, instead he found a lovely place filled with smiling people, with children laughing. And he asked somebody as he got home, what has happened here? Why has this place changed? I don't remember it like this. And the man responded to the traveler who had come back home. Mr. Wesley has been through here. Mr. Wesley being John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement. That Wesley had come through and he had proclaimed the gospel. And not only had he proclaimed the gospel, but then he put people into groups. He told them to watch over each other. And they learned the Bible together. They learned to pray together. They took care of each other. See, that's the kind of impact I believe God wants for his church. That's the kind of impact I believe we can have 
here at Trinity if we as a church and individuals in that church remain connected to the vine? But how, right? It's always the question, how do we do that? How can we remain connected to the vine so that we can bear fruit, right, in our community for Christ's glory? See, up to this point, I've given you a lot of how to in this message. But let me give you a little how to now. I've said we ought to remain in Jesus. Let me give you a little bit of practical how to, how we think we can do that. The first way we as a church, and if you're following along the message down below, here's the fill in. First way we as a church can remain in Jesus so that we bear much fruit for the Father's glory is to be committed to prayer. Committed to prayer. The Apostle Paul, writing to one of the churches he had contact with, wrote this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Philippians 4, 6. Then Jesus himself promises in these very verses today in John 15, 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. See, prayer is important, church, when it comes to remaining in Jesus. Prayer is important to when it comes to remaining connected to the vine. Prayer is important if we're going to be a church that is all that Jesus dreams us to be. We have to be a praying church. Not just a church that gives lip service to prayer, but a church that is grounded in prayer. Because you know what? When we are grounded in prayer, we are then committed to acknowledging that anything we do is not in our own power. See, when we are committed in prayer, we are making a statement that we are powerless to do anything apart from Him. Being committed to prayer says that we recognize, that we acknowledge that ultimately God is in control, that He is in charge, and apart from Him we can do nothing. Again, Paul talks in another place about how he planted the seed and how another evangelist, Apollos, watered, but it was God that provided the growth. It was God that was in charge. Being committed to prayer opens doors that only God can open. And it reminds us that this journey that we're on is one that we don't take alone, but that one that we take with someone by our side. And that someone is the Lord Jesus Christ. Prayer is integral to remaining in Him and thereby producing fruit for His kingdom. Not only is it necessary to remain in Him by prayer, but it's also necessary to remain in Him, stay connected to the vine by clinging to God's Word. By clinging to God's Word. To remain in Him is to bear fruit and bring glory to God. And for to do that, we must always keep the Bible close by. The Bible is the norm and the rule for our faith and our life. It is God's life-giving word to us. It is basic instructions before leaving earth. The early church leader, Paul, that I've been talking about, once wrote to his protege, Timothy, a letter. And he gave him this bit of instruction, which I think is, is so true for us today. He said to Timothy, wrote to Timothy, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. And Paul suggests to Timothy, so it's true for us that the scriptures keep us wise, they keep us steeped in wisdom, that they are the norm and rule for our faith, that they guide us as we look to the future. They call us to do what we are supposed to do. It's in the Bible that we find our marching orders as the church, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
We hear there in the scriptures the promise of a God whose love is so great that he sent his son to live and die and be raised for us, and not just for us, but for the world. You see the purpose of the church as we find it in the scripture isn't to have holy huddles. The purpose of the church isn't even to have church dinners. The purpose of the church is instead to be Christ's hands and feet, to go out there and to share the gospel in word and in deed. Clinging to the scriptures and being committed to prayer helps us to remain in him so that we can bear that fruit for his glory. Finally, this morning, if we want to remain in him as a church, we not only have to pray, we not only have to be people of one book and be people of the word, but we must imitate Christ. That's the third thing. We must imitate Christ, especially as it pertains to his record of service and sacrifice. It was Jesus, as I was mentioning earlier in this message, who took out a towel and washed his followers' feet before they enjoyed that last supper together, before he went to the cross, whereby he gave them the example of service. And then on that fateful yet libera liberating day, he went to the cross, giving his life and spilling his blood in the ultimate act of sacrifice. And so as people who say that we want to be like him, to follow him, to imitate him, then that means we are called to similar service and to similar sacrifice. And if we keep that central to what we do and who we are, then we will remain in him and bear much fruit. You know, Jesus once said it like this, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Luke 9, 24. Yeah, you see, church, Jesus once told us to take up our cross and to follow him. Jesus never said, take up your pillow and be comfortable and follow me. No, he says, take up your cross. Take up that symbol of crucifixion, that symbol of dying to oneself, of giving up one's preferences, of giving up one's own comfort, and follow me. Well, how about you? And how about me? What are we willing to give up? What are we willing to let go? in order to bear fruit for Jesus, to be all that Jesus dreams us to be as individuals and as the church? What are we willing to sacrifice so that God's envisioned reality for our church might come to fruition and we might bring glory to the Lord? What are we willing to, to give up so that even one person outside the walls of our church, we come to a life-saving decision to follow Jesus. Are we prepared to let go of cherished traditions of the past? Are we prepared to let go of those famous last words of the church? We've always done it this way before in order to be all that Jesus and his Holy Spirit calls us to be? Are we prepared to give our time, our talent, yes, even our money, to see God's dream for our beloved Trinity United Methodist Church, to see God's dream for our community out there realized? Are we willing to do anything within the bounds of the gospel church to ensure that people in our community experience Christ's love so that one sinner might be saved, so that one family might be changed, so that one addict might be recovered, so that one person might be brought out of poverty, so that one marriage might be saved, so that one hungry tummy could be filled, so that one ragtag child could be clothed? What are you willing to do? What are we willing to do 
in imitation of Christ, who gave up his life. He's not even calling us to give up our physical lives. But what are we willing to do in imitation of Christ? To sacrifice for the sake of God's mission through his church. You know, as I've had the opportunity to, to visit amongst our church, even in this time of, of COVID, as we've had safe visits, and some of you came to the church and visited with me. For some of you, I've sat outside under a tree with you. For others, you've met me on your side porch. We've had these visits. And, and one of the things that, that I have heard is not a thing that I haven't heard before. It's not a thing that a lot of other churches don't say. But the one thing that I have heard that, that's come through every time was, as I've asked folks the question, you know, what's your dream for, for Trinity and at this church? And, and they said, you know, we need to, to reach younger families. We need our church filled with children and, and youth because we need to leave a, a legacy to the next generation. And like I say, a lot of churches say that. I spent three years consulting with churches. Every church that I consulted with said the same thing. It's a universal desire of many churches. It's a great desire. But the problem comes when the rubber hits the road. When we begin to say, well, what will it take to reach younger families, children, and youth? And we begin to play that out and what that means. And, and some of the things that that will mean begin to, to make people feel real uncomfortable. Changing worship times or worship styles, or adding those, or making some wholesale changes in a building, or any number of things go on and on down the line, but they, they tend to make people feel uncomfortable. And so on the one hand, we say we want to do this, we say this is what we envision, we think this is what God envisions, but are we willing to do the hard work? Are we willing to, to give up Maybe a cherished thing in order to reach the people that we might feel God is calling us to reach. After all, the one that we follow, the one that we say that we follow, was willing to give up his life on a cross. Are we willing to give up a seat, a worship time, a cherished tradition? A way of doing things that we've always done it. I don't know what God might be calling us to. But it's a question that's worth asking. It's a question that's worth pondering. Church, these are not easy things. But I want to say to you, all things are possible with God if we remain in Jesus. If we remain connected to the vine. I hope we as a church can remember these things now. And especially as we come out of this pandemic. Because here's the one thing we know, and that is, as a church, we're not going back to normal exactly as we had known normal before. Things have changed forever. But what hasn't changed, what hasn't changed is Jesus Christ and his love and his power and his strength and his wisdom that's available to us. Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I hope each one of us individually will remain connected to him. I hope we will, as a church, remain connected to him by being committed to prayer, by clinging to the life-giving word of God as we find it in the scripture. I hope that we'll have a willingness to imitate Christ's model of service and humility. It's remaining in him that we'll bear much fruit for the kingdom will bring glory to God and we'll see his dream realized for us, for our church, for our community. Father God, we pray, we plead, oh God, that you would help us to stay connected to the vine. We know, Lord, that apart from him, we can do nothing. That we know, oh God, that if we're not connected to the vine as a church and as a people, 
that we are powerless, that we will do nothing of lasting impact apart from him. So Lord, help us. Help us, oh God, to, to stay connected to your son, Jesus Christ, the vine. Help us, oh God, to be a praying people, to be a praying church. Help us, oh God, to be connected to your holy, life-giving word. May it guide us. May it be the rule and the norm for our faith and our life. May it guide us as we seek your direction. May it guide us as we seek to be in mission for you. Help us, O oh God, to imitate Jesus. To move beyond just being nice. Yes, Lord, you call us to be nice, but you call us even more than that. You call us to be salt and light. You call us to step out of our comfort zones. You call us, even Lord, to, to lay down our lives. To lay down our wants and wishes and our preferences. So that others can come to know you and know your love. So, Lord, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us this morning. That we might stay connected to the life-giving love and power and strength of the one true vine, Jesus the Christ, in whose sweet and precious and powerful name we pray this morning. And all God's people said. I invite you to join with me in our hymn following our message for this morning called Have Thine Own Way, Lord. As we invite God to have his own way with us, I invite you to sing the words as you'll find them printed in the order of worship or there upon the screen, hymn number 382, Have Thine Own Way. Eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, 
true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now at that point in our worship service where we mark our morning offering. If you happen to be a guest with us this morning, I want to let you know that the words that I'm going to say about our morning offering aren't intended for you. But if you are somebody that regularly attends here at Trinity United Methodist Church, if this is your home church, if you're a member here, know that we count on you to continue the ministries of our church. But if you're a guest just worshiping with us, just know that, that our worship service this morning is our gift to you. So please don't feel any obligation to give. I want to let you know that uh, each month here at Trinity, we have a special mission focus. We call it our Mission of the Month, where we ask folks to contribute above and beyond what they give to the ministries of the church. And I want to let you know that our mission focus for our Mission of the Month this month is uh, Heart Havens, which is a wonderful ministry uh, to persons with developmental disabilities and helping to find uh, homes and to minister to those persons that are in need in that way. They do wonderful work. And so um, I would invite you to prayerfully consider uh, giving to the Heart Havens Ministry as our mission of the month. This time I'm going to invite you to join with me in prayer and then following our prayer we will uh, sing the doxology. Let us pray. God, we thank you for everything that you have given to us. Lord, from our next breath, to the clothes on our backs, to the food that we eat. We know, oh God, that it all comes from your gracious love. Lord, it's in response to your love for us that we give to you. We know, oh God, that this whole world and all that is in it belongs to you. So what we give back to you, Lord, is first what you own. And so, Lord, we pray that you take that which we give back to you. Bless it, multiply it. Let it do your work, Lord. Give this church wisdom to use the gifts that it is given, to be good stewards, to use the gifts in such a way that bring honor and glory to your holy name. We make all these prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. speaking about in the message, part of being a praying church and people committed to prayer and staying connected to the vine in prayer is that we have a time in our worship where we go to the Lord in prayer to lift up those people in our community and beyond that stand in, in need of prayer. And so inside the weekly trumpet, you will find uh, this morning a list, a prayer list of our church. I want to encourage you to uh, lift up those people in your personal prayer life. They would surely appreciate it. Um, servant. I want to lift up to you um, some people that were added this week uh, to our prayer list. Please keep uh, Dakota Adams in your prayer. Uh, Dakota is uh, headed to a Navy boot camp, and so uh, we want to remember uh, Dakota in our prayers as he goes for that uh, exciting time 
Also want to um, keep in our prayers uh, George and Sylvia Copeland. That was requested by Beverly Gates. And also keep in your prayers Roberta Thompson. As well as all of those that are on our prayer list. As well as those that lay silently on our hearts. So will you join your heart with mine and let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to end up our time in prayer by saying what's known as the Lord's Prayer. You can find that printed in your order of worship if you need to follow along. Let us pray. O oh God of grace and God of, of glory, how magnificent are your ways. Lord, when we contemplate your greatness, when we look to the heavens and see your handiwork, we are just left to wonder, who are we that you are even mindful of us? But Lord, you love us. You know us intimately. You know, know every part of our lives. You know every joy and triumph that we experience. You know every roadblock that we need to push through and every challenge that is before us. And you are the God who has promised to meet every need that we have. Lord, uh, such knowledge, such love, such grace and mercy is just beyond our limited human understanding and comprehension, Lord. It's just unfathomable to us how great you are, how you are the God who does the impossible, that you are the God who loves us so deeply. So we thank you, O God. We thank you for all that you are. We thank you for the many blessings that you have poured out upon our lives this week. Lord, sometimes we are slow to return thanks. We sometimes, Lord, take for granted all that you do for us. But Lord, this morning we come to give you the praise and the glory to say thank you. Say thank you, Father, for all that you have done. All that you have done in the past, all that you're doing in this moment, and all that we know that, that you're going to do in the future. Thank you, Father. But we also come to pray to you and to ask your intervention in the lives of those that we know and love, that need healing, that need comfort, that need peace. But we come to ask that you would go with those who are entering new ventures. Pray, Lord, for those who need a door open. Pray, O oh God, for those who need a sense of your presence, that need to experience some hope. Pray for those that are struggling financially, Lord. We pray for those who are struggling relationally, whether that's in marriage or in family. Lord, we pray for those who are parenting and need strength. We pray, O oh God, for those who are experiencing difficulty in the workplace. In short, Lord, we pray for every situation, every person who needs your grace. We pray, Lord, that you would pour out your healing, that you would pour out your comfort, that you would pour out your peace, that you would give hope as only you can give hope, that you would indeed, Lord, help those who stand in need. Lord, we continue to pray for this community. We pray for the lost in our community. Especially we pray, Lord, for those who think they have no need of you. But we don't pray in judgment, but we pray so that our hearts would break for them. Give us a heart, O oh God, a heart like that of Jesus, who told us about lost sheep, lost coins, and lost sons. May the same heart that your son Jesus had for the lost, may that be our heart as individuals and as the church. Lord, as we live our lives, help us stay connected to the vine so that we might bear fruit for you, that we might bring you glory, and that we might have a part in your kingdom. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples and taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Our final hymn this morning is number 139 in the hymnal, called Praise to the Lord the Almighty. You can find the words printed in your order of worship or there up on the screen. Praise to the Lord the Almighty. so much for worshiping with us this morning. It was our pleasure to have you worship with us here at Trinity United Methodist Church. If you haven't had the opportunity yet to click on that link and fill out our registration form, I encourage you to, to uh, go ahead and to do so as we end our time together in worship for this particular Sunday. I like how this old hymn puts it. It says, Let the Amen Sound from his people again. Let the Amen sound from his people again. I want to encourage you to go out from this time of worship. Stay connected to the vine who is the source of our strength, of our power, and of our love. Stay connected to the vine so that we might bear fruit for him. So that indeed the Amen would sound again. So that we would be all that God dreams us to be. As you go and as you do that, may you be well, may you stay safe, may you stay healthy. May God be with you until we meet again. Go in peace.